Good to have you in Des Moines. Let's get, let's, before we forget, what are you doing tonight? Well, it's good to be in Des Moines. Um, yeah, so tonight is going to be pretty epic. We're finishing, um, this is our 27th state capital in America. Come on, let's go. And, yeah, and we purposely, purposely scheduled to end the, uh, in 2023, this part of the tour in Des Moines. I wanted this to be the final landing place for this year, so we're excited. Yeah, Unreal, and that's 5 p.m. tonight? 5 p.m. tonight at the state capitol. We hope all of you are there. It's going to be a wild party. We were in Lincoln, Nebraska last night. We had, I don't know, probably close to 3,000 people in Nebraska. Oh, wow. Showed up, oh, wow. so we'll That's see what... the whole state. At least half. They at least came. half. The yeah. whole state yeah. came. So tonight we got to see what, uh, what God's going to do in Des Moines, and we're excited. Come on now. And then, uh, so what have you been doing on these tours? Like, like what's the purpose of... Of the Capitol Tour. Yeah, so, you know, Let Us Worship was, was birthed really at, in a very dark time, high through the pandemic, yeah. and um, started as a pledge. And it was really, you know, uh, I was provoked to make this pledge, really focusing on California New York. I was in California. We were like the most lockdown of lockdown, which is hilarious because I'm like the most anti-lockdown guy. But it yeah. was very locked down. And so... We formed a pledge called Let Us Worship, and we had, you know, over 100,000 people that signed it, and then the Lord began to speak to me about, you know, putting feet to the vision. It can't just be a pledge, like, put faith has to come with works, and so we started this movement. Anyway, so we went across, I don't know, 180 cities, had the largest church meeting recorded on the earth in the year 2020. Washington, D.C. Whoa, come on. Yeah, really, really crazy. For over 40,000 people, 45,000 people yeah. in, in our nation's capital. That night of our Let Us Worship in D.C., that same night, Amy Coney Barrett was confirmed to the Supreme Court. Oh, come on. It was, a, it was wow. a crazy thing. Anyway, long story short, we did all those cities, and then the Lord began to speak to me about, I was ready for a sabbatical. <laughs> My wife was like, all right, we've, we've just been attacked. We've just been, I mean, it's been insane, but it was awesome. But let's take a break. And uh, the Lord was like, here's your new mandate. And he began to speak to me about the capital cities and about how, you know, the fight for life, the fight for freedom, the fight for religious liberty, the fight for our children. It was all going to the state capitals. And we understood in COVID how significant our state capitals were. Yep. Yep. You know, like, realize it. they thought it was old federal, but people didn't even know who their yeah. governor was. They didn't even know yeah. that. And then all of a sudden now you got to turn on TV and find out what your governor is saying you can do or can't do. Yeah. And so California was living, living very different than Florida. Yep. And in, and a lot of it comes down to your state and, and their jurisdiction. So we realized the power of state government. And, um, so anyway, yeah, long so so God began to give us this 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 journey, this dream, and I was like, "There's no way we can do this on our own. This is insane. It's millions of dollars. It's dealing with, and this is no offense to Des Moines, but probably the 50 worst cities in America, <laughs> the bluest of the blue, the yeah. hardest of the hard, high yeah. crime, high bureaucracy. You know, resistant to the gospel. Yeah. They want to have drag queen shows, but they won't let Christians come pray. Yeah." Yeah. Right? So vandalism is good, worship bad. Yeah, riot, yeah. burn down the streets. That's fine. You're good. You're Christians, well, you're super spreaders. Well, we, you know. we were contemplating like marching down the street and like blowing stuff up as we worship. And like under cover of violence. That could have worked. You know, like that undercover worked. worship, you know? That could have worked. This will be a, a, a clip that will be used on YouTube out of context. Yeah. <laughs> We should, we'll get back to your version though. It's, yours is better. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So anyway, you know, we, we just realized the power of that. And, you know, a, a big part of it too is just rallying the church to take responsibility for their state. Yes. You know, putting, yes. putting political leaders on notice. Hey, the church is awake. Yep. We know what's going on in this building. Yep. We're not going to back down. We've been worshiping for 2,000 years. We're not about to stop We're now. We're not going to stop now. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And so my homeland, 
So I come from Australia. Uh, my wife's Australian, um, and uh, our first two kids were born there. The, and what we notice, people say, what was the difference between Australia and America? And as you know, Australia made California look like a bastion of freedom, right? right? During, the, during the pandemic. And, uh, and, and every time I said the only difference between uh, Australia and America, if you could pin it down to one thing, it was pastors and worship leaders and, uh, and ministers and churches in America had backbones, and in Australia they didn't. And in Australia... So in America, churches said, no, we're not going to stop. Here in America, we're like, no, we're going to worship. You know, we locked down for six weeks and then we felt convicted that as the lead pastor, I was in sin. And so I got up to the church and said, I'm sorry, I repent. We're never going to do that again. That, that was on me. Don't blame my board. Don't blame anyone else. It was my fault. And after that repentance, our church started growing, right? Phenomenally. Uh, in, in America, where churches were locked down and then they stood up and said, no, we're going to worship, they went to court. And they won their court cases. Worship leaders went to capitals and said, arrest us then. Arrest you. What, are you going to arrest all, all, all half a million of us? And because of people like you and people like these guys here in Des Moines and people like, uh, like you know, the churches in California and Florida, they won the court cases and that paved the way for the rest of the country to live in freedom. But in Australia, they just didn't do that. They were like, yes, daddy government, whatever you want. And so here, I think the churches and people like you set an example for the community that, no, we're going to live in freedom. We're going to, we believe we are allowed to worship. And even if we weren't allowed, we are going to worship. And that changed the story for this country versus other countries like Australia, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it, it comes down to... The, a fear of men, you know, are yeah. you, are you going to obey God over the government? Yeah. And if you want to break that down theologically, I think the theology of the American church was really tested in COVID because, you know, um, people throw out Romans 13 and they misquote it and then they misrepresent it. It is good to obey the authorities when they are under the authority of God. Amen. If they go Amen. in direct conflict, I mean, this is the thing I'm like, What happened to the book of Acts? The church of Jesus Christ was birthed in controversy. Yeah, and it was illegal. And and they came to Paul and Peter and they said, you know, listen, you're going to have to stop doing this. And they just, Paul and Peter just laughed. I'm like, we're not stopping. Yeah. Was that true? Uh, What did he say? Um, You obey whoever you want, but I'm going to follow, I'm going to obey the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. And so we had to to come face to face with that. And I think for Americans, it was very unique because we think, oh, government's got our back. And, you know, and then you got these pastors that, you know, they're trying to appease the woke mafia. They're trying to appease all these people. And I'm like, man, you can't do that. You either bow your knee to the Lord and serve him. You cannot please everybody, and there are times and there are seasons, and this isn't just with COVID. This is a lot of ideologies that are being spread across a nation. We have to know, like, our allegiance is to the king. Amen. Yeah. It's not to the president. It's not to the White House. It's not to a political party. It's not to an ideology. We serve Jesus. That is our master. That is our Lord. Amen. Amen. And... And, you know, the church was really tested with that. Now, I think the biggest thing that shocked me was it's like we are, we are not, we are not, don't have the muscles that are built up used to the resistance that the church throughout history has faced. Yeah. In America, we're not. So we're, we're like, well, if you love your neighbor, you're going to go put three masks on and hide in a room and watch a live stream. And that's how you're going to love your neighbor. And I'm like, mm. yeah. I mean, Jesus walked into sickness. Jesus yeah. brought light to darkness. Jesus mm-hmm. brought hope to hopeless. Come and when on. we started Let Us Worship, what was the eye-opening moment for me was when we were, you know, the most locked down city in America was San Francisco, 21 day shelter in place order. And the Lord told me, all right, go gather people in, in San Francisco. I'm like, God, you're funny. Like no one's going to show up. <laughs> Like, like you are sending me into like the worst city, the dumpster fire of America. And the Lord spoke to me, no, no, go gather, worship, prophesy, pray, declare. So we, so we go to the Golden Gate Bridge and I'm thinking no one's going to show up here. This is the first one. This is the very first one in, in the summer of 2020, uh, full lockdown, fear, pandemic, craziness, and, um, 300 people show up. On the Golden Gate Bridge. Yeah. And, and a very diverse, eclectic group of people, by the way. Different denominations, different ethnicities, different backgrounds. I mean, it looked, it was beautiful. 
So as we were marching onto the bridge, this police pulls up on his, on his, motor, on his motorcycle, and he's just bewildered. He's like, what, what's happening here? He's like, I saw a group of people. Yeah, normally when I see groups of people like this nowadays, they're angry. You look happy. <laughs> you, got, you got guitars and shofars. You're not coming to destroy. What's going on? I said, well, well we, we've come here today to pray for the city. He took his helmet off. I'll never forget this. He took his helmet off. Tears started coming down his, his face. He goes, what took you so long? Mm, he yeah. goes, you are standing on the number one suicide destination in America. Golden Gate Bridge. More people have jumped to their death from this bridge. Yeah. More people have died from suicide than have died from COVID in California. Mm. And I didn't realize God was sending us to the number one suicide destination mm. to prophesy life coming over Amen. the nation. To reverse the decree of death. Amen. Amen. <laughs> The, I, I just kind of, I can imagine the police though. Like imagine your faces. You're thinking this guy's going to shut us down, probably arrest us, and he's just there to say thank you. Yeah, and then he, he invited 10 other patrol cars pulled up, and he said, if you want to pray here, we're going to make this happen. And he, they shut down one whole lane on the Golden Gate Bridge just so we could pray. Oh, come on. There it is. Yeah. Amen. And so then after that, then, then how long until the next place you went? Um, after that, we were in Huntington Beach the next day, um, and it was just like a sporadic spur of the moment. The, the, the Facebook feed went viral. It was like yeah. everyone was locked down, and it was like, what are these crazy people doing? And <laughs> it's just like, you know, the Facebook Live was like on the bridge, you know. It was, oh, yeah. wasn't cool at all. I mean, I came from a mega church. Right? Le worship leader, mega church. We got the best live stream. We got the best sound. Like, we got skinny jeans. We're cool, man. Yeah. <laughs> and now I'm on the Golden Gate Bridge, and it's like, this live stream. Wind but blowing. it was real. Yeah. yeah. It was real. People could feel the anointing, you know, through their phone. Yeah. And so we showed up next day, Huntington Beach. Thousand people show up on the beach. And that was the moment when I realized, okay. God is calling us to press into a new Jesus people movement because people yeah. were getting baptized. They were getting saved. People were throwing their drugs yeah. down on the beach coming to Jesus. Mm -hmm. The LA Times, it was the first and only good headline they ever said about me. <laughs> but they said revival in Orange County was the headline oh, that wow. day on the LA Times. So. And then they flipped. And then they flipped. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you said it was real, right? And I think that's what's happened to the churches that grew backbones. Um, and like you said, and it was not that they were necessarily cowardly, but there was not really opposition for 200 years against church in America, right? And so when the opportunity came to actually work those muscles, you know, and not lean on, well, Romans, Romans, you know, which by the way, submission, if you're here, uh, we teach at Eternity Church that submission to government is a posture that desires cooperation. Okay, so we desire to cooperate with our government, we desire to cooperate with our city, we desire to, but we won't when it's ungodly, right? But the moment something doesn't conflict our, uh, our faith, doesn't conflict well, the Word of God, we'll cooperate. You want us to pay tax? It's not ungodly. We'll do it, right? And so uh, it's a posture, right? And so I hate it when people come up and be like, you have to obey the authorities. I'm like, no, no, submission is a posture, if I tell my wife, if she's living in submission to her husband, if I tell her to go stab Gavin to say happy birthday, she, she's not going to do that. Do, do you know what I mean? And so, um, but anyway, so during this whole season, we found churches got real and they yeah. started getting authentic and it got back to just, you know what, you can be cool, but your faith better be real. Yeah. It's getting tested. And I think that now one problem that churches are going to have, and I don't want to end up there. Uh, is that there's going to be an attempt to professionalize the authenticity right. that has come with this season. Do you know, does that does it make sense? Yeah. Like, and so like the authenticity is like at our church, we're just going to stop pretending that Jesus is happy, go lucky, do what you want. Mm -hmm. That he actually, that this book was actually there to guide your life, yeah. not just to tell you I love you. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, waking up and standing up and opening our church, I think we were the first, out of the churches that, which is most of them, to close in Iowa. I think we were the first to open, right? But that moment created a courage in us that helped us be authentic with the community about what we really do believe, you know what I mean? And then as a result, 
we're baptizing people galore. Like three or four months ago, we baptized 101 people in one weekend. We'd never done anything like that before. So it's interesting that with that authenticity and courage is coming revival, is coming salvation, is coming transformation. And, uh, but I do think there's going to be a temptation to professionalize the authenticity again. Well, I think, so. you, know, um, you know, Billy Graham has a state, had a statement that I loved, you know, when a courageous man takes a stand, the spines of everyone else are stiffened. Yeah, yeah, and, I am. You know, but, but, but there's, a, there's another take on this where, you, you know, you look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you look at Daniel who prayed when he, they, he, they said he wasn't supposed to pray. You know, they didn't bow when they were supposed to bow. Um, you look at all of these examples throughout history, it's not just defiance of government or, or you know, civil disobedience. It's actually an act of worship to God. Amen. Yes, it is. So Amen. when you're resisting, and I mean, you could put it into 2023 terms, you know, they're not shutting the church down because of a virus, at least not yet. We'll, we'll see when the new COVID variant, election variant The election comes. variant, yeah. Yep. Apparently it's coming, so it's for sure coming. be ready. But, <laughs> but we are seeing things like, you know, you got to uh, supply uh, children with puberty blockers if they're confused about their gender and, and mutilating body parts and yep. ideologies that were forced and pastors being forced to do uh, same-sex marriage weddings and, and different things like this. I mean, these are direct violations yeah. against the Word of God. So when we act in defiance... That is worship to God. Amen. Yep. Amen. Right? Are you guys with me? Yeah. Iowa. So, but like, like this, this is not like people think like it's going. We're going back to chill times. Like we are not ever returning to the pre-COVID chill era. Yep. That's right. It's important for you guys to understand. I just want to get back to normal. Ain't, Ain't normal no more. Yeah. Yeah. There is no more normal. And for the sake of the church in America and where God wants to bring us, we cannot go back. Yeah. So what this means is that we're not trying to, you know, oh, we're going to fight the government. You know, that becomes our whole stick. No, no, no. It's far bigger than that, man. Yeah. We, we want to serve Jesus. Yeah. We want to see revival. Amen. We want to see the kingdom. Amen. But understanding that this was the first of many tests to come. Yep. Yep. And if you're here and you feel like you didn't really do well on the first test, on the COVID test, and maybe you backtracked in fear, maybe you over, you know, got anxious, maybe you bought into whatever, don't sweat it because there's another test coming. Yep. Right? Another yep. test is coming where you can prove the truth of your worship and your love and your dedication to the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. There is a, like I, I found, even in me, you know, I'll be honest with you all, occasionally I get this temptation to be like, well, let's just maybe, you know, we can, we can sort of back off on this or on that or, you know, and, you know, maybe let the heat die down, let the hate die down, right? And, um, and the thing is, though, that we might have a good year, you know, where no one threatens to kill me, but then the next test is going to come again. We, maybe it's the election variant, maybe it's just, maybe it's just you know, the, the, the political direction of our state changes and then we have to stand up even stronger or, you know, like, are we going to, what are we going to be? Are we going to be fair weather bold Christians? We're so good at being bold in fair weather, you know? Um, and so that temptation to professionalise or to chill... Um, Like, it's hard to, 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 you know what I mean, to keep standing up and to keep going. And uh, I, I was talking with some of our friends and about that. Like, when you, when you keep going strong, which we are here and we won't stop, like, we're not going to forget what it was that God blessed. Like, and it was our boldness and our dedication to the word, right? Uh, it, the truth and grace, not the grace and grace, right? The truth and grace. That's what God blessed, and that's why our church is, I don't know, 30, 40% bigger now than it was before COVID. Because God blessed that. We're not going to forget why he blessed us. But it still is hard when people want to attack your family, threaten your family, threaten you, say we're going to kill you. You know, we've had, we've had, you know, the need for armed guards at different times in our lives because of threats people had made to us. And, um, and, and I'm sure that then we're just, you know, there's like, 5,000 people in Des Moines that know who I am and that's it. You know, you're on a national stage, an international stage where everybody knows your name and 
all, all the triple maskers want you dead. And, um, and <laughs> how do you deal with that? How do you deal with the, like, if I get a threat every month, you must get it every day. How do you deal with that? How do you, how do you keep your heart sweet yeah. and kind in the face of all of, of that such very personal vitriol? Yeah, I think, you know, I think there's, there's an understanding, like, we, we don't have a very good theology in America on suffering. Mm. Like, we actually don't, like, any type of suffering yeah. or persecution, we're like, the devil, the devil, the, you know, and we always... My toaster broke, it was the devil. Yeah, And that's exactly. their suffering. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so we don't really have a theology that embrace that, but, but if you look in the New Testament, or even the early church, or the persecuted church, which I spent most of my time with before we were doing a lot of ministry in America, you know, that's, that's where I was focused, a missionary kid, that's who I am. They, they carry a, a paradigm of suffering. They know when they follow Jesus, their life is dead. Like, you can't kill them. Like, they've already died. Wow. And I think in America, we, you know, we come in, and I believe, you know, we got our rights, and we got our freedoms, and I believe all that stuff. Trust me. Like, yep. I'm, I'm, I'm bummed. I'm missing hunting season here by a couple of weeks. Yeah, come back. Time, time, it, time it better, you know. Mm-hmm. But... We got all our rights and all our stuff and our entitlements and the things that we feel like we're owed and we're doing all this stuff. But at the end of the day, we are dead men and women walking. Mm. And we're following Jesus. Yeah. And Jesus commissioned his disciples. <laughs> and he said, you know, in this world, you're going to have trouble. Yep. Probably look at him thinking, you're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to die. Ah, Maybe I'll keep this guy over here. He can stay on an island. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but take heart, I've overcome the world. And so, and so if you are not, and I would say this, this is my honest opinion for Christians in 2023. If you are not getting canceled and censored and pushed back mm-hmm. and people coming against you, are you really following Jesus? Yeah. Because yeah. this culture outside is only growing more hostile. Yep. To the gospel, and and yep. what's powerful is when we begin to embrace the fact that we're going to have resistance. Now, I got four kids. Yeah, I take threats very seriously. I get them all the time. Yep. However, I refuse to be the guy. You know, at six a.m. today in your church on Fox and Friends, the number one up show in America. I want to be the hope guy. Yeah, come on. I want to go on there and not be like we're so attacked, we're so uh, uh, play the fiddle. No, I want to be like God's moving in America. Amen. Amen. There's a lot of bad news, but I got good news. Amen. You know, and so we stay Come joyful, on. we stay hopeful, but realizing that God has commissioned us into a dark world where we're going to face, yes. uh, we're going to face stuff, yeah. you know, but he's given us the power to overcome. And so that's my encouragement. I think it's yeah. only going to get crazier for Christians, but the glory of God is going to rise on Amen. you. Amen. Like Amen. 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 Yeah, I, you know, Jesus said, they, the world hates me and they're going to hate you. And, and Paul let us know we're going to get hated. And, and James let us know we're going to get hated. And then someone hates us and we just get so surprised. And we're like, I can't believe someone hates me. I wish someone told me it was going to be like this. And Jesus is like, I, I said it a lot of times. And then we all act so surprised that the world hates us. And, uh, you, know, and you know, in the fair weathers, we love quoting Paul. You know, for me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. And then COVID comes and we're like, I, I better stay home. You know, like, we, we, we better not go to church. You know, we could go to court if we do. And, and uh, but yeah, I agree. I think like we're stepping into a season where, it, where it's got to be real for me to live as Christ and to die is gain. But the thing is, like, when you die to yourself anyway and you just say, right, I'm just going to live Christ. That's it. Christ in me and me living for him. That's it. That's all I'm going to do. It's a way better life anyway. That, you know, it's, it's way better. And people attack you and people hate you and whatever else. But, um, but, like, someone threatening to kill you when you're living for Christ is just, you still have so much more peace than when someone says, I don't like your outfit when you're not living for Christ. Do you know what I mean? Like, like for real, like, before I, before I was legit 
Like, I, I don't even, I'm not even convinced that 2019, early 2019 before that, I'm not even legit convinced that I was like really living for Christ. I had a great church and I loved people knowing my name and, you know, whatever else. And watch the podcast one day, but, but I don't even, I'm not convinced I was living for Christ. Back then, if you told me that my outfit sucked, I, I feel like that probably hurt my feelings more than I want to kill you now. Because when you're living for Christ, it's like, you, yeah, people are going to hate you, but there's so much hope and joy and peace. And when he says, you know, a peace that the world can't take away, they can't take it away. You can only give it to them. You can only be like, all right, fine, I surrender my peace. But man, when you're living for Christ now, and so I have found that that attitude and that that offense is building a stronger Jesse, a stronger father with convictions that are shared, a stronger husband, a stronger leader, a stronger preacher, which is building a stronger church, in turn a bigger church, in turn seeing more souls saved between, I don't know, 20 and 60 every week. And, and, and it's, it's come out of that strength, not out of the I love you Christianity that, that we were preaching, which is true. I love you, and Jesus loves you, and all of you. But this is a way better life, you know? God's way is way better, and they can see it. Amen? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we... We got to get back to this crazy journey with God where we're, we're taking risks and yeah. we're, we're doing things that haven't been done before. And, and, and Christians in America, they, we can go into kind of settlement mode, but like we're, we're called to be pioneers. And yeah. so leaders. When, when COVID happened and, you know, schools were shut down, all that kind of stuff. And I was just like, soccer was canceled for my kids. And that was a bummer. Then flag football was canceled. And it was just like their whole life was like one bummer after another yeah I'm like you know what we're just gonna we're gonna take them out of school we're gonna homeschool on the road and i want th- these kids to be marked by revival across america amen in the darkest time yeah. in history amen and yeah. so you know my kids were with me in portland yeah <laughs> like the the night before we got to portland they were burning copies of the bible on the courthouse steps it was the most dangerous wow. city in America. People were being murdered. I mean, it was like, and, and I brought my kids to Iraq with me, and I brought my kids everywhere. But the I mean, Americans were like, I mean, they thought I was the worst dad ever. Yeah. How <laughs> dare you bring your kids into Portland? I'm like, I thought we were called to go into dark places yes, and worship. Yes, amen, amen. Like, I don't want my kids to be afraid of darkness. I amen. want them to know that the moment light shows up, darkness flees. Amen. And so they grew up. They grew up those two years having these wild testimonies of watching Antifa members go down to the altar and give their life to Jesus. Yeah, come on. Watching protesters that came to disrupt things get saved, seeing mm. people get baptized, healings, deliverance, miracles. Like that, they'll never forget that. Never. They were marked by revival in a very dark time. And that's what we need to do is not be people that, 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 that react and people yeah. that sit back and people that wait. No, no. We are the church, man. We take ground. Yeah. We yeah. go out. We, yeah. The, the Great Commission is not go and hide. Amen. You know, the Great Commission is, is go. Go into all the nations. Go into all the cities. Yeah. like what we're doing today. We're bringing worship to the capital. Yeah, if there's yeah, any place on. in Des Moines that needs it, it's the capital. Amen. Amen. Right? Amen. And we're going to pray, God, break the corruption, break the perversion, break the, you know, all this stuff that's, that's going on there. God, bring freedom, bring light, bring hope, bring boldness. Like, this is the kind of stuff we want to raise our kids in, a Come culture on. of Come the on. kingdom. Amen. Come on. Yeah, I think kids that have actually had to stand up for something before they go to college have a chance of standing through college, right? Yeah. Like, and so we're so busy trying to raise kids that are just telling everyone how much Jesus loves them. And again, you do need to know that, Right. Like the goodness of God that leads all men to repentance, right? And so you do need to know that and you do need to see the goodness of God. But the goodness of God is not continue what you're doing. The goodness of God is your life can be transformed and it can become better, right? And, um, and so what I found, we, we have kids that have been through our youth program in the last three years. And sure, going to the wild youth, which is our youth ministry, will mean that there are kids at your school that won't like you because you go to that bigoted youth ministry where they are willing to teach about marriage 
where they're willing to teach about abortion, where they're willing to teach about gender, where they're willing to teach about what submission to authority really means, right? And because of that, they're going to get heat at school. But if they can get a little bit of heat at school and have to like stand up and grow a bit of a backbone, my kids go to a Christian school and you know what? They still get some heat. Some people still don't believe what they believe, right? And when you have to defend your faith at school, when mum and dad are there encouraging you and supporting you, you might have a shot at getting through college and still believe the word of God. But if the first time you ever see a, a Christian war zone, so to speak, is in college, I don't think you've got any hope at all. You know, well, you've got, you know, go in, have an encounter with God, of course, and all things are possible. But your kids, they're going through Christian wars now. My kids are going through Christian wars now. If they go to college, and hopefully they don't, but if they go to college... <laughs> <laughs> but if they go to college, they might actually have a shot at making it through with their faith intact because they've actually ha- worked those spiritual muscles and they've had to defend the faith a little bit. So, yeah, I mean, we last night we were, in, you know, in Lincoln, Nebraska. Obviously, you got you know Nebraska there, the university, and and you know these campuses are, have just become indoctrination centers where Crazy. it's like the the wise people are stupid now, like it's. They're, you know, they, they can't tell that there's 858 genders and there's, I mean, there's Bit no, of a sweet, good there's for no bad, clarity. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so kids are getting caught up in this. But, you know, last night, God's antidote to this is, is always revival. God's yeah. antidote is always encountered. So last night we had, I mean, gen, so many Gen Zers there and 25% of Gen Z battles their sexual identity they don't know who they are right the enemy has come to attack them yeah you know to attack their sense of identity because if he can destroy their identity yeah he can take their destiny yeah and so last night we had a moment where it's just like man who is here battling identity like like god wants to free you you are fearfully yeah. and wonderfully amen. made he did not screw up when he made you amen and, and kids just raising their hands all over the place. I want to get free. I want to get free. I want to get free. And Amen. in one moment in the presence of God, he can undo four years of indoctrination. Amen. Amen. You know? Amen. So that's what we're believing for even tonight. Yes. That's good. People can't believe how many Gen Zers and high schoolers come to this church. Like, we had um, a news group, I can't even remember which group it was, I think it was New York Times, came to one of our services or two of our services uh, about eight, seven or eight weeks ago. And and afterwards I said to the guy, a really nice guy, and honestly they were super respectful, really kind people. Um, But I asked him, I said, what surprised you? And they were surprised that, they're just picturing like, you know, like uh, 1,500 people with grey hair and MAGA hats, Although I got my make Ameri- making holiness great again hat on, and there's nothing wrong with your mega hat. I, I like it too. Let's let's do it, right? But but they're expecting that. They're expecting everyone's white, everyone's 75, and everybody's bitter and twisted. And uh, and they came in, and and they're expecting me to just in the middle of my sermon be like, vote Trump or vote DeSantis, or, you know what I mean? And and I'm like, I, I don't know what you read, but that you know anyway, but. They're looking around, he goes, I can't believe how many Asian people there were, black people there were, Hispanic people there were, white people there were, even redheads were in our church, you know. You know you're a diverse church when redheads feel welcome in your church, come on. Where are my redheads at? Come on now. I got a red mustache, I'm with you, you know. But, um, you know, they just couldn't believe it. Because we have, and, and like other pastors will say, where are, they, where are the young people going to church in Des Moines? And they're here. And it's not just the Jesus, uh, Jesus loves me church. It's the Jesus loves me and can make my life better. And I need to do what he says, church. You know what I mean? And, uh, and it's, we're a spirit-filled church. We believe in revival. We believe in having an encounter with the Holy Spirit and that he can set you free of your ideologies and your confusion and everything in one moment at an altar. Or, or, or you can be healed as someone comes and lays hands on you and prays. And they, it was so bizarre for them to see that the church that, had, that, that was being labelled the ultra-conservative megachurch had probably one of the, probably the youngest crowd in town, you know. And, and we have older people too who love it, don't you? Like, you know, especially in this service, come on, right? And um, the young people are like 8.30, yeah, no. And then they come at 10.30 or last night. But, 
But, um, but yeah, it yeah, blows I, their minds that, that, that God is attractive and truth mm-hmm. is attractive and the Holy Spirit, an encounter with God is attractive to young people too. Yeah, so. yeah I, I, think, I, I think too, like, you, like young people are craving, like this is a very biblically illiterate generation. Yeah. And so we, you know, we, we have like all of the, any bit of information we need right at our fingertips, but we're like dumber. <laughs> like, yeah. It's, um, does that make sense? Like, I don't, yeah. it's just weird, you know? D- but, dumb phones. Do what? We have dumb phones. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, but, but yet there's a craving, right? And I'm a millennial, right? So the millennials were like, you can do whatever you want and follow whatever you want and religion sucks and you know and it just it bred this whole generation that was just like wait hold on where are we going what are we doing anything goes anything goes and it's led to you know to to people leaving god leaving the church leaving the faith yeah um you know this this horrible demonic theology of all roads lead to one and do whatever you want and it's yeah. all about your life you're gonna find fulfillment it's all about you just look inside man just go look inside and discover yeah. the depths of yourself and i like start looking inside i'm like eh, it's not too good like i want to yeah. look up you know yeah, yeah so so there's a whole generation right now and we're seeing it in america i mean i'm i'm telling you i've been to 27 state capitals yeah 27 as of tonight Every single one is tons of young people. Mm, yeah. Like they're craving to know who God is. They're Amen. craving they to know yep. why they were made. They're craving to know how they can follow this man. They're, they're craving to know. And it's like we have to be the church that disciples a generation. It's like we actually have to yeah. resist the urge. I mean, we, we actually yeah. need to get more systems in place for how to yeah, disciple yeah. them, yeah. how to tell them what to do. Like yes. these Bible reading programs. I mean, I got my yep. kids every night, man. My kids, they're hooked. They, they don't go to sleep until they get their action Bible out. And they Come read on. through the action Bible. And it's like, we have to equip our kids yeah. to know the word yeah, of God. Amen. That's the only way they're going to make it amen. in the days to come. We, we've, um, we're, you know, we're building because we're running out of space and whatever else. And you'll see that more so in the next service as well. Uh, we've got a campus. By the way, we have people in Allwine and Audubon watching right now too, by the way. So hello, everybody. And... Um, but one of the things that we're committed to building is a bunch of adult classrooms. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I really do believe that life groups killed biblical literacy in America because life groups gave any Tom, Dick, or Harry the authority to tell everyone in their life group what this means when they don't have a clue. And, the, and, and, and so people would be like, well, I feel like it means this. It's like, well, there's no feeling like what this means, what this verse that you read. When it was written, it was written to mean what it means. It doesn't have multiple angles. It doesn't have multiple possibilities. And we need to know what it means in context. And, you know, like, you know, uh, what is is it? Uh, uh, I can do all things through a verse taken out of context, right? And, uh, And so we have these life groups of people saying, like, I think it means this, and a leader who doesn't know how to lead it. And, and so I really, so what we like passionate about, one of, one of my favorite things about our new building is, yeah, the, the baptismal that everyone gets to watch from the road, but, 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 but building classrooms where people are equipped with the word of God by people who are approved to teach the word of God, you know, people who know the word of God teaching the Word of God on hard topics, maybe walk through books or, or maybe how to read the Bible properly or what does the Bible say about homosexuality uh, other than just don't do it. Why? How do we know that, you know? So people are equipped to handle the tough questions. And I really believe that life groups killed biblical literacy in America. But we're going to make Wednesday night church great again. And we're going to teach people the Word of God. Amen. And so they need to know it. The kids need to know it. The, the adults need to know it. We've got adults that don't know it. How are the kids going to know it? You know, and so, yeah. Get it. Yeah, I mean, the, the, you know, the, the, the society likes to paint this as archaic, and we're progressing, and we're so smart now. We're so, so much more advanced. Yeah. I'm like, eh. Like, I went to buy an airline ticket the other day, and it's like, which gender are you? And there's like five options. I'm like, we're not that smart. <laughs> We've actually regressed. What is it, in, that in picture? Our, in, our, in our insight, you know. The picture um, of that caveman and, walking up and like, have you seen him like slowly standing up on his legs and then he looks at 
the world today and goes, oh, we messed up and turns around and I want to become an ape again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> or the aliens that show up and they're like, oh, we'll, we'll check in later. Yeah. We'll come. Come back in a um, hundred years. Yeah, I mean, it, it, there's, there's nothing that's more relevant and timeless and, and powerful that cuts through the chunk of what we're dealing with in this book. And yeah. I think that that's why there's such a battle um, to exterminate it, to remove it. To, yeah. to I mean, I just laugh at these Mm. these you know satanists they, there's a whole satanic capital tour that started yeah, uh, because that. of me yeah uh i'm like <laughs> their enemy number one which is kind of cool because it's like well I'm, I'm finally doing something with my life that's stirring up satan yes it's like yes he doesn't want to counterfeit one dollar bills Mm-mm. you know he wants to come after the good stuff yeah, and so on. and so the Satanists, they're you know they're like <laughs> showing up at our events and 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 burning the Bible and they're and they're you know they're doing all this stuff like like it's all just a show. It's just so fake. It's yeah. like they they really got no power, no authority. But a lot of Christians are like, oh no, they're coming. And I'm like, dude, we won this battle two thousand years Amen. ago. Amen. Amen. Yeah. You gotta but, stop. but I love it. I love that they keep coming because eventually they hang around long enough. They're going to meet Jesus. Amen. Amen. You know, um, but but I, I think, you know, there, there is a fight for truth. There is a fight and, and it's not good enough. I want you guys to hear my heart on this. It's not good enough in America to just say we're conservative and we stand for blah, 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 blah. And I'll tell yeah. you, the conservative movement is in many ways trash. I mean, it's full of people that propose and push these ideals and they don't live by them. And, you know, they use God as their own little thing. And it's just like, no, no, no. Like, yes, we're conservative in what we believe, but what we believe is the word of God. Yeah. Not a party And what we want to see is revival. America is all out of political solutions. Yeah. We have no political solutions. Mm -hmm. We got to have a move of God. And that's the desperation that drives us to drive all across America with our bus and our gear and all of our stuff. You'll see later today. I mean, we show up at the Capitol. It's an entourage. Yeah, come on. You know, because we are desperate to see God move in our yeah. nation. Yeah, amen. Amen. The, um, the time for churches to be scared of the world is just over. Like, it should never have even begun. Like, okay, a Satanist comes. Oh, well. Like, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So why are we scared? You know, we either believe this or we don't. Amen? We believe it or we don't. And he's a healer. Uh, Greater is he that is in me than he is in the world. And what are we going to do? Like, back down? And I love what you said, too. Like, I'm not going to be the guy who the... my, My favorite political party platform is my truth. Like, like, hey, the day I became a citizen, and by the day, I mean, like, I drove from my swearing-in ceremony to the county office and registered as a Republican and voted early. The day, last year. But the Republican Party platform, though I'll vote for them, is not my truth. This is. Amen. The Word of God is the truth that I'm living in my life and preaching. Amen. We gotta make sure we don't just live a cultural Christianity where it's like, ah, oh, our culture's Christian. It's like, no, I wanna be Christian. I wanna be a follower of Jesus. Amen. But well, um, we we all wanna worship with you in a moment. And you know, some of them right now, they're already starting to text me, let us worship. And I'm like, okay, we will. But um, but can you just talk about some of this stuff just real quick? We don't actually yeah. normally let people do this, but we really like you. And so <laughs> We want you oh, to tell th- people about this. Is this is some of th- these are just some books that kind of share some of the journey of let us worship. Also, my journey. This one, brazen. My journey of, of being a worship leader, and then the Lord telling me, with a crazy dream in the middle of the night, to run for U.S. Congress in California. Which, <laughs> just by the way, I don't recommend <laughs> any of you doing. Um, however, uh, it, it's just kind of crazy to see how God. You know, birth this brazen. This was written actually before uh, Let Us Worship started. And it, it kind of, the book ends with like, hey, you know, the Lord told me to do this. I lost. I feel like um, I feel like I miss God. I don't know why he had me do this. I feel like I ruined my music career. And I don't know why he told me blah, blah, mm. blah, blah, blah. And then it kind of picks up with the journey of the boldness that was prepared in my heart. Oh, in this come season. on. So anyway, that's in the back. We have some I don't know. We're at the end of our tour, so I don't know how much stuff we have, but I'll be in the back if you want a book signed. You're vibing Brian Welch in this 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> really? But, yeah, that's what I, I'm like, is that Welch? This no. is actually, the, the cover of this is actually inside a bus that was blown out by ISIS in Iraq. <laughs> oh, wow. And we, we do a lot of refugee work in the Middle East, and I was like, my, I was like, this would be a cool picture. And my team was like, don't climb in there. There may be bombs. I'm like, it looks already pretty blown up. So <laughs> anyway, they took a picture and we used it. It's kind of cool.